Welcome, everybody back here at Siegel Talks at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center CUNY at the City University of New York in Manhattan, in New York City that has been hit so very, very hard. It is the epicenter of the Corona crisis and the Corona moment that we thought would perhaps a bit relax. At the moment, there are signs that it is not going well. Uh, today, the New York City Marathon has been canceled for the fall. Um, yesterday, on Tuesday, we had 35,000 infections in the US. It is the second highest or third highest number in the entire month, in the entire time of, uh, of Corona. Since April, we haven't had such numbers. Over 2 million people are infected. Over 100,000, many, many more died. Some people we don't even know that they have it. So. Um, it's a time of complication. Amnesty International is reporting from 12 European countries, uh, uh, violence against minorities, against Roma in, uh, in uh, Romania and harassment in Paris and some neighborhoods. Immigrant neighborhoods fines are three times as much when you don't wear a mask and in a posh and, and uh, uh, mostly white neighborhood. It's uh, shocking to know Sweden apologized, it has 62,000 infections and over five, 6,000 people dead compared to Denmark, which we will hear a bit later. Uh, Belgium is opening theaters, the pubs are opening and restaurants in Britain, they pretend uh, it's all back going back to business, but uh, numbers are not uh, favorable. Uh, Brazil had 1,700 or 1,374 dead people in one day. It's the highest ever recorded and uh, over 1 million um, infections. So um, it is, uh, uh, it is a, a, a shocking numbers. Globally, 475,000 people are dead, 9.2 million are infected and um, people don't seem to take care of it. Uh, uh, Putin had a military parade without masks uh, and uh, the EU is officially considering when it opens its borders on July 1st, that no American can come to the European Union. Uh, because uh, they feel America is not able to contain the virus and America would be in the same boat with Russia or Brazil as a nation that is no longer able to control it. It's shocking. Our president doesn't wear masks. He tells people they should inject themselves with uh, um, disinfectant. He goes into bunker or he has police uh, uh, clearing peaceful protests and holds up a Bible in front of a church. It's shocking. It's wrong and we are very worried about a summer perhaps of violence. Uh, people have no trust in government, no trust in their workplace. They are confined at homes. Temperatures are rising and we all hope that uh, what needs to change will change. We as theater people are on the side of life, on the side of uh, protest, but also to look at it in different sides and using art and changing ourselves and then to change the world. Um, in Saudi Arabia today said instead of 2.5 million people, they only will have 1,000 visitors coming for the Haji, the great uh, visit in Mecca. And uh, since first time over a thousand years, moshes are closed. So it is a time of incredible upheaval in the world. We are a car that came to full stop. We are flipping in the air. We don't know where we land on wheels or not on the side. Is it a total crash? It's um, um, uh, complicated. Uh, so in these times, uh, we need to hear voices of artists next to the economists and virologists and uh, PR managers and politicians. Artists have been on the right side of justice. Artists have been on the right side, in the complex struggle for freedom and liberties. And if the world would listen to them, the world would be a much better place. If you look at any history, they always were what ultimately in the social justice and the progress of social justice they were on the right side. In the world, we have many artists and significant artists, but they're also always artists who um, are masters of their field. They transcend even their own role. And some people say we have two Western masters left. Uh, in, when masters of theaters, where are the masters of theaters? The profession has changed. Maybe it doesn't exist anymore, like the master critic, the master, but there are two left in the West. It's Peter Brook and it's the uh, great Eugenio Barba. And for us here at Siegel Talk, uh, to have Eugenio with us is a big, uh, big day, is a significant, also in the, compared to what we just heard about the complications 
we are living in. We are all in the same boat. And um, it's a fantastic to have him with us. And I want to say just a, a little few things and, uh, about him and his life. He grew up in Italy. He lost his father early uh, in World War II. He didn't come back. Uh, he um, then uh, thought about becoming a sailor, a, a welder. He uh, wanted to perhaps go to the military academy, rejected it, and then somehow ended up as an immigrant in a way. Uh, learning, studying theater in Poland, and then working as an immigrant of theater in Denmark, first a little bit in Norway. His company, the Odin Theater, is for people who know theater history, know about theater, is one of the great, uh, almost biblical stories, the great epic stories of theater. They did 79 productions in 56 years. Um, some of them took two years to prepare, he went to a small space, created an ensemble, he created a work for people that could stay together. He um, talks about uh, the work he learned from Kotowski with the body, with the work, poor theater, theater in small spaces, theater that is also geared towards justice, somehow it was a political uh, mission. He um, created what he called also the uh, center um, for um, theater uh, anthropology, and, uh, and uh, he is teaching, uh, the anthropology is the science when human humanities combine the history of the people of the earth. So he connects uh, his work um, to that. And um, he has been quoted, and Bogart, who was on, his, on our program said, she quoted Barba as the main force when she said about stats, how to prepare for things, the moment before the action takes place. So, and she, um, of course, has influenced so many others. Just to give you um, a little idea. So his uh, ISTA, the International School of Theater Anthropology is open. You can go to the website, you can learn about what they learned. And um, I uh, normally don't talk so much. It's because perhaps I'm a little bit nervous about all of it, um, but um, Virginia, really, thank you for coming on. How are you? Where are you? What time is it? Thank you very much for uh, inviting me, uh, Frank. I am living in a small town in Denmark for the last 50 years. And at 5 o'clock in the evening when the shops close, all the center of the town uh, looks like uh, an empty landscape, urban landscape. So when uh, the coronavirus obliged all of us to remain at home, it was not very uh, difficult for us living in a small province and not uh, uh, going outside after five, six o'clock. People just go where they have to go to some concerts, if when there are concerts, theater, when there is theater. It is a very peaceful uh, provincial uh, town with a lot of um, associations uh, where people gather is one of the characteristic of, uh, uh, I would say, the democratic spirit of Scandinavia. A lot of uh, grassroots associations, people gathering, sport, uh, Esperanto, languages, uh, dogs, race dogs, but associations where people meet and, uh, and create a sort of uh, tissue, social tissue, which is independent by the, the mainstream and the uh, manipulation of uh, the press. So the quarantine for me was work as usual. I went to the theater. Then I met some of my actors. We were rehearsing. What changed uh, drastically for me was that uh, I was not traveling anymore. I, half of the year, I'm on, uh, on the road, uh, on tour with my actors or uh, alone or with some of my actors. So for five months, since 30 years, I've been <laughs> here in Ulster, uh, and this has been a, the, the, main, the main change in my life. Otherwise, it has been the a, 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 a situation of uh, uh, work, 
concentration and maybe a, a realm which was more calm, which gave me possibility of uh, reading and seeing many other things, mostly reading, because this is what I, I enjoy. Mm -hmm. So Denmark locked down early and um, <clears throat> what is happening? <clears throat> Do you wear a mask? And for how many weeks or months are you? <laughs> Strangely enough, <clears throat> nobody uses masks here in Denmark because uh, the, uh, the medical authorities meant that it was of no use. So we are, I think, one of the few countries where we still can see people smiling. A friend of mine was telling me in Germany, he was a German stage designer, it was very strange to go to a new theater. You speak and you, you know if people are smiling to you or are very serious. No, we don't use masks here in Denmark. Mm. It, was, it was sort of a shock for all, uh, for most people, I would say, what was happening because in our imagination, had never been able to imagine something like this. So um, it, uh, it was interesting to see how the, then, the Danish population uh, responded with a sort of civic uh, responsibility toward the uh, medical and uh, the prime minister was asking us. So it was a huge, huge, civic discipline, which was very admirable, I would say. Yeah, and very low cases of virus, very few dead people in Denmark uh, compared to Sweden. Yeah, it, 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 everybody was surprised because uh, everybody was expecting much more uh, cases of um, illness and uh, but uh, the, the, the virus was contained and uh, we can say that the lockdown functioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is uh, quite incredible. And you also use masks in theater, but nobody wears masks, but otherwise people do wear masks, you know, that whole idea of uh, the yeah, face. Yeah, when, we, when we see in television, we, it is very, very strange to see that everybody is masked. <clears throat> Although by law, in many countries, it's prohibited to wear masks in the streets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. In the United States for a time after some, uh, uh, I think after the um, civic unrest, uh, Sakoti Park in New York City and occupation occupied, say nobody's allowed to wear a mask. Now everybody has to wear a mask. <clears throat> it, is, it is strange. Um, as a question, you know, you, um, you know, I think you have, I counted it, 16 or 17, honorary doctorates uh, from around the world um, for, for your work. And um, one you got uh, in 2019 from the Peloponnese uh, University in Greece. You said, you wondered what will happen um, when we, this island of freedom, this theater world we live in, when there are no subsidies anymore, when we are uh, in, a different <clears throat> in a different place. What, what do you think about theater now? What, what is happening to theater? Throughout the whole history of our profession, theater people was dependent from uh, financial resources given by uh, sponsors or uh, the church or uh, public uh, authorities. From the very beginning, it started in Athens. It was the town was giving a lot of money and invented this strange expression called theater in order to glorify the town's political system, which was unique at the time, democracy, to the point that the Athenian authorities were paying the citizens to go to theater because they were losing a working day. So <clears throat> from the very beginning, there was a body who was paying for people to do theater. In uh, Europe, 
was in the Middle Age, the church, who was providing uh, funds for the religious mysteries. You had a lot of spectacular manifestations, but those were so-called charlatans, etc., who were then selling something afterwards. They were using theater or theatrical manifestations, music, stills, all this, to attract people and sell something. But the great moment of freedom for us theater people was when the first professional companies were created because in winning the 1550s are the first contracts. When the first companies arise from a professional theater, they liberate themselves from the church, from the aristocracy, and they invent a territory of uh, freedom where the spectators are paying very little and therefore they can begin again to do what they want, the theater people. Then with the time, once again, the spectators want to have certain things and therefore the actors became again prisoners of the market. Then there was another attempt to liberate uh, oneself. Because all the time there was this sort of uh, uh, a complementarity in our profession. On one side, we need uh, resources, economic resources to do theater. And on the other side, we want to be independent from the power who's giving the money. And in a way, uh, condition our way of doing uh, theater. And the, 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 the attempt to get a new freedom where well, at the uh, end of the 19th century when something called art theater arose. These small theater who were uh, not uh, longer interested in complying with the taste of the spectators. And it is the first time that the word art is connected to our profession. Our profession has always been and still is a commercial enterprise is an enterprise where you join in order to entertain spectators. Then you can give a, a, a an aim, a sort of um, metaphysical uh, 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 um, value to what you are doing. And this is what happened through the art theater when in the 20th century, theater was entertainment, but at the same time could become a tool of uh, uh, ethical education, of uh, political awareness, therapeutic, uh, artistic, aesthetic experiments. So all the names which really have shaped our uh, horizon our way of thinking and do theater. I'm speaking from Stanislavski, the first one, it's art theater. He writes a biography, my life in art. He says, you didn't say my life in theater. I mean, for him, art he was connected with a sort of uh, particular location of um, our profession and not just only entertainment, which it's fundamental because without entertainment, you bore spectators. Entertainment, entertainment is the zero degree, it's the fundament. It is, it is so important as, uh, I would say, bread in a, in a Mediterranean diet, but bread is not only enough. So you have these, uh, 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 these artists, who begin to give to theater a sort of uh, um, uh, extra value. And then I can mention, there are Merkel, Gordon Craig, 
uh, pianism, and if, if you think of the thousands of theater, theater daytime uh, was the only uh, entertainment, and then comes, then comes film, and film is our uh, epoch performance. And in a way is uh, uh, taking away the importance of our profession. Uh, live performance is reduced and is still reduced for, yeah, the number of spectators are reduced. So what can we do with this profession, which uh, strangely enough is not disappearing in spite of all the technology. Each generation, new generation, young people comes to theater. And here comes the question, why do people choose to do theater? Why don't they choose a profession which is useless, meaningful, noble, why don't they become doctors, anthropologists, pedagogists, pedagogues? So the question is not if theater is necessary or is important. The question is, what is theater for me? We've chosen this profession. The society doesn't need theater, I think. The proof is these days. They have opened everything, banks, schools, even universities in Denmark. Theater is still closed. Nobody is protesting. And they can continue to keep it closed for one or two years. Nobody will protest. But theater is necessary for me, who is doing it. Therefore, I went to theater. Nobody sent me a telegram or a letter or an invitation, Mr. Barba, please all oh, come and do theater because we want you to do it. It was my necessity. And this is what I think. There will always be on this planet people who have a wound, who is longing for something, want to escape. And therefore they will join theater. So I'm very optimist, in spite that the numbers show that statistically we are the theater is diminishing, there will always be a sort of enclave, small enclave, with people who will try to build their own island of freedom. There will be, I hope, the huge body of uh, theater, which is entertainment, which is the big industry, which because this gives to us a reflection uh, of uh, the importance of our profession. It's present. It gives good arguments, economical arguments for tourism, but it gives also for the theater culture I belong to which is the culture of theater groups, of uh, those, this very strange particular um, uh, wave of uh, joining together, which happened after 68, in the 60s, 70s. I have begun before because of age. So when I began, uh, it was in 64, so I, I, I began according to what I knew from theater history. I was not accepted in professional theater. All right, I could begin as an amateur. And I began as an amateur. And then uh, slowly I managed, yes, I say, I managed to, to <clears throat> set up or to invent a new production system, which was not only dependent on performances, with 
Berlin Theatre in 1965 begins what are today a huge market of workshops of uh, uh, an alternative pedagogy. In the 64, there were only theatre schools. And, uh, but no one was giving workshops. So when we start doing this, it was very difficult for uh, traditional actors. We were all traditional actors at the time. There were no this huge, rich polyphony of uh, 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 theatrical uh, manifestations, expressions as, as today. It was very building, this building they were performing uh, texts. And in those days, the, uh, the, the ferment was given by authors, by people like Beckett, UNESCO, the uh, angry young men in England, the way the, uh, the playwrights who were giving a sort of uh, uh, disturbance in the criteria and the norms of uh, uh, the theater life. But when all the interiors, and then you have uh, Peter Schumann in the, in the uh, in United States, you hear La Mama who opens, but it's very interesting when La Mama opens this space of freedom in New York, it is in order to help playwrights. And only in the 70s begins this very, very different way of considering theater as a sort of physical, spiritual experience. There, of course, are those texts which were published in the early 60s, Grotowski, and then many, many others have been contributing to this deep, deep change, which has not affected very much the, what you can call the main body of theater. But where in Latin America, for instance, where these uh, uh, huge industry, theatrical industry doesn't exist, all the, the, the ferment, the richness, the, 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 the rage, the wrath, the, the lust to fight, I'm still existing as an individual. It is coming to this world. And therefore, I'm um, optimistic. There will always be in a generation someone who wants to fight because a deep wound will make them join together with others. And not yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, do you think, oh, let's go to the, how are you, what are you thinking about at the moment when you have the time, perhaps a bit more, you say you're still rehearsing, but is this time of Corona changing your view of the world? Are you seeing things different? Uh, no, 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 no. I think that uh, the human being is an animal that uh, is not generous by itself, that he can uh, accept what is different in small doses, when there are bigger doses, you become racist. Uh, I, I don't think that even if technology is being used much more in this period, this has to say, yes, technology is also being used to make children. You can make children in, in laboratory now, but uh, most of the people want to make children will go to the archaic technology of making love. And the same will be in the future with theater. People will go, if they want to see theater, they will go and see human beings uh, in front of them. So it's not changed. I think that at once, at once we will be over this, people will forget because this is the great, the great 
I don't know if it's a good consolation that our memory will <clears throat> there's a not um, uh, persecute us with memories of horror. People can forget and then goes on and get involved, uh, committed or indifferent to what's happening in the present. Mm. Um, I, I think in 99 you wrote a book which came up with Black Mountain Press. It's called, if I have the title right, Theater, Solitude, Craft, Revolt. Is this mo a moment of solitude in the, in the, in that will help to shape craft and become a, re a revolt, will become a, a revolution or something that turns, do you think? I think solitude, <clears throat> there is a bad solitude and a good solitude. <laughs> solitude is when it is imposed on you and you are lonely because you are excluded, then you will feel solitude. But uh, solitude it means that you yourself choose a moment of retiring from the social uh, uh, links, connections you have to be together with yourself. When we speak about theater, we speak of two very, very different things. We're speaking now about theater and this is something big, general, as it was only one dimension but then there is another way of uh, knowing what theater is. And it's the daily struggle that each theater person has every day to get up, to take the streetcar, the bus, to go to a venue. And for some people, venue is a huge um, theater clean or somebody has been clean etc for others this is maybe a cellar or a, a garage or a, 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 a store or some filthy and then you have to find the or you have to face the hundreds of decisions how to find the money how to do this and so theater is this sort of personal struggle with a lot of decision when you're alone you are alone, especially if you are a director, and you have the responsibility for other people. Of course you are alone. You can't go and have a uh, sort of consolation from your actors. You have to give energy to your actors. So, so this is, I think, I think a solitude is a fundamental part of our, our profession. I think, this I know because when I arrive in certain small places and I, I go and, and visit or because I, I, I've been invited by a, a theater group. I see what it means for them to have uh, the visit of uh, a, a foreigner or, or, or a person because you are isolated. But this is what I also experienced when I was in Poland in a communist country in the early 60s, how the country was closed, there were no foreigners. And as a foreigner, I was enjoying a, a status of uh, first uh, economical uh, security, I had a scholarship, and uh, uh, also uh, psychological, uh, intellectual security, because I had a passport, I could leave this country at any moment why Poles and as old communist uh, countries inhabitants had no possibilities of living and this sense of solitude of being isolated. And therefore it was so important, the exchange. So solitude I think is a, 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 a part of uh, our destiny. Of course, I know that it exists a, a culture today where to being together is very important, where to so mobilize or to engage the spectators as if it, people is forgotten that exist two types of energy. The fact that you are looking at me, you don't do nothing, just look at me. Does it mean that you are passive or that you are inside you using it? 
another type of energy, the mind, which is in this very moment active, trying to shape words and find the, the, the right sentence in, in this language, which is not mine. But you, you are taken, you are driven by a receptive energy. And this is the other. This is a moment where a receptive energy meets an active energy. And the actors know this very well. They can feel this sort of vibration, quality of silence that the spectators can create. And the applause, certain applause, which are sort of, and then other applause, which almost are like tears or like uh, crying. So, <clears throat> yes. I think solitude is the destiny of an actor. The moment you start an improvisation, the moment you are facing the task, you are alone, nobody can help you. The director can take you until a certain door, a certain demon, a certain... And then the actor goes alone there. The director remains. The actor sails away. I remain on the harbor see him really facing all the, the dangers of superficiality or of uh, selfishness or of uh, losing, losing the feeling, the thread which uh, um, lets you come back to what is the professional awareness, or if you want, the professional uh, superego, which means you are doing all this for somebody else. And this is the spectator. Because theater is the spectator. We can do all the exercises we want, we can do all, but if you don't think that this is something which I'm giving, offering to a person, which I call, spectator. And this spectator is a person who is offering me one hour, two hours, three hours of his her life. Winter time, snow, cold, and then they go out of the world of the house and take a bus and travel half an hour, maybe one hour to go to the theater. It's good if it's a big theater. If it's a small theater. It's not very comfortable. So, and they come. And you must give to this person who is offering three hours of his, his her life the best. So, this is the aspects of solitude which you face in the, of, uh, is the preparation for this meeting, for the performance. So, Yes, but remember, always solitude is maybe so good, and there is a bad solitude. Mm -hmm. A bad solitude in not having chosen it. <clears throat> When I started in 1964, All my friends and everybody thought that I got, uh, I was disturbed, mentally disturbed, because they couldn't understand that I would do theater without having a venue. At the time, it was impossible to do a theater, theater without a venue. Uh, all amateur theater had a small venue with a stage and <laughs> a, a place for audience. And the fact that I was working in a classroom in a school and then started going in a gym, they couldn't understand. It was something totally wrong. Yes, most of these, I felt very, I felt solitude, although was not solitude. I was not recognized. Uh, but I had these three, four, four young people who were following me. And this gave a huge, huge feeling of power, of being not alone. And this is very important. I would say in, in group theater, uh, 
where people gathers and establishes emotional uh, ties that uh, do not uh, happen in a, in professional theater. I mean, when we speak of theater, we speak also of two very different uh, uh, work organization. You have a, a, a mechanically, I say, uh, aggregate, aggregate, aggregated uh, experts which are chosen because they have to achieve a certain uh, standard in a product. Your actors are chosen according to this, the director is uh, chosen, the stage designer. So all they are aggregated in order to uh, shape a result which must have a certain quality. But in group theater is very different. People would gather us first of all because of certain uh, needs, personal uh, interests, so too often uh, ideology, um, but also because they create sort of micro so uh, social, small social, uh, uh, I would say, culture. And they build their own their own rules. And first of all, they are all most of those groups are autodidact, which means they all have gone uh, 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 on the on the same process from a sort of ignorance and insecurity for something which gives them a feeling of worth of professional identity, and this is shared, this is shared. So, uh, <clears throat> when I started, we were speaking about bed solitude, it, it was not, the fact that people was not considering what I was doing uh, healthy, I would say simply healthy, I mean, uh, It didn't disturb me so much because on one side I had these young people follow me, and then of course it's enough that one person believes in you. And my wife, my wife, she was working and um, gaining the money so that I could completely dedicate myself to this insane <laughs> passion and. Uh, but you see, when I say in St. Rashi, not because I want to do theater, but because I didn't want to give up. I didn't want the society or other people to decide on me. It was a sort of infantile uh, reaction, maybe. But also because uh, for me theater was necessary because it was a refuge. I want to escape the discrimination I've been living as a what a dago, a <laughs> also it's called the nigger, uh, in, among Scandinavian workers, or especially when I was a sailor, and I was a sailor was a really uh, unpleasant experience for us uh, Italians, Spaniards. So you were really discriminated by your fellow sailors on the ships. Uh, but this is the reason why I do theater, because I had to- Tell us find. a bit, tell, tell what happened, what made you, what happened and what was the moment? <clears throat> in the workshop, I was working as a welder in a workshop, it, it was, a, I was very accepted, never I felt this sort that I was different. But this happened when I, I became uh, a singer. And then uh, they, they, they simply, not only they insult you verbally, but the violence is also physical, in the sense that if you are queuing up to get your food, <laughs> Scandinavian concept throws you away because as blonde albino, he has the right to come forward me. So all this was a continuous struggle and fight and and then when I went back to 
to Oslo, <clears throat> I have continued to work in the uh, in the um, this workshop. But then I, I was also studying at the university. I was almost finishing at the university in the evening. And then I was asking, say, what well, I'm going to be a teacher. But then this experience of how to hide my ethnic uh, background. Because <clears throat> when people saw me, this was in the 50s in Norway, when there were not many foreigners. They, as I told you before, when there is a, a small doses, it is a curiosity. And a lot of people treated me kindly, openly. But also I felt that this was a sort of discrimination, that they were not treating me like a normal person. So this, of course, I, I enjoyed very much when they treated me well, then <laughs> in the opposite case. Then I start finding, is it possible to find a solution to this problem? And then the solution I found was that I could become an artist. And then I found I, I cannot write, I cannot paint, I cannot. So I found out that uh, there is a, an artist who sits on, on a chair and says, do this, do this, do this, this is the director. And that's why I decided to go to theater. But I have to confess, theater in itself, or the performances, very few performances interest me. Otherwise, what I like is to, to work and create something which everybody thinks is not possible to create. Far away, everybody says, no, you can't do anything in a small provincial town with the North theater traditions, etc. And I enjoyed going there. And, and we had no performance. And at the time of the theater, still today, the theater is designed or is defined by the, the, the by the identity of producing performances. We can uh, for months and months, sometimes even for one, two years, don't produce performances. But we have many other activities, and this is what uh, is fascinated me: how our profession, which consists in establishing relationships, we establish relationship with the text. The past with yourself, of course, as an actor, the director, in order to uh, transform all these in live movements, intonation, silence, um, relationship to the spectator, to the space, to the death. So, how can I could I, I could I use this knowledge, this know-how in other situations, which were not only uh, making performances. And this is what a group of actors, which is characterized by a personal obsession, not to lose them from the, way, from the very beginning. I want them to remain with me because they had been my teachers. I, I've learned what I know thanks to these youngsters who left Norway, the country, the language, the family, the friends, and followed me to this small village uh, town in, in Denmark and built uh, this uh, new way of, well, life is a new way, or old way, but it's a possible way of using what people consider theater. Yeah, and they stayed with you. Yes, they stayed. Very often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they did stay not because they loved me. Of course, they loved also me. But uh, because as a director, my first duty, I felt, was to give them a salary every month. So I managed to secure a, a, a basis, an economical basis, 
not very much, but they could live with it. In a, in economy, in a personal economy, it's not how much you earn, but how much you spend. So if you live in a small town, you spend much less than in a bigger town. And this was one of the reasons why I accepted, I want to leave a big town and go to a smaller town, but also because I'm very political minded and I knew that in order to conquer the capital, you have to go to the provinces and then slowly encircle, encircle the, the, the bigger towns. So this was <clears throat> the reasons, economical reasons, and then of course, a, a period of uh, training in the sense of preparation, which was very, very hard. So that a lot of people went away. And those who remained, remained because they found the meaning in this sort of work, where I could dictate hard working discipline, but I never dictate ideas. They could think what they wanted. There is no method, there is no philosophy. I am no one who says theater should be like this. What I want is that each of them could become as free as I felt. And then they become, and they have started to hear personal projects. So today, when you come and you see the 12 actors of the theater, they are at the same time directors, they have their own groups, they organize their own festivals. It is a sort of like, I feel like, King Arthur with his knives, and they are going doing a lot of very, very uh, different uh, initiatives, which are even far from my interests. But this is very important. Theater has been made them grow, and then at the same time, there is this sort of extroverted let's say, aspect, but there was the introverted when we gather together. And then we prepare a new production for several months. And uh, we can uh, invent the project where all together we can uh, try to conquer a, a town or uh, uh, do uh, something in our own town hosting room. So these are the reasons why people remain with me, because they also found the possibility of uh, uh, developing their own personal interests without coming into a conflict with me or with the interest of the company, the group. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it is um, absolutely remarkable. If I <clears throat> understood right, you know, you were also rejected from art school in Norway. You found actors, all of them who were off by the institution said, you know, you're not an artist. You will not never be an artist. He said, yes, we can. It is not, it is, it is a necessity. <laughs> and you created something uh, out of that. And you said, I'm going to go to a small space and a small place and then conquer. So <clears throat> there is something in there. And it obviously worked, you know, that for all artists who are listening also, I think Eugenio found next to his artistic work, also an organizational work, an economic model, he found something that uh, helped to create great theaters. Great theater. Is, is, so you, yeah, so your method of production in a way, I created I think, it. also I the aesthetic that, outcome. Is that a kind I of think, a... I think that what uh, was a, 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 a very stimulating uh, aspects of Odin Theatre. It was not only to see a group of actors well prepared in making performances which touched those who saw them, but also the way we were organized and we uh, were earning our money not only through performances, but also uh, pedagogy, I mean, all the workshops starts with Odin Theatre. And the fact of the Ebenio, where, uh, which is not with a, a, um, a stage and the separation, it's black room. Uh, it, it starts here. But that we have a, a, a publishing, very important. Many theater, many theater groups 
especially in Latin America, starts following. Uh -huh. So we publish also. And then we alliances. I always say, because this is the characteristic of our profession. We are not able to collaborate with others because we are different. And my, 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 my attitude has always been because all my immigrant experience, of course, we are different, but uh, we have to find the point of contact. Therefore, I've been collaborating with many, many theater groups, uh, including with projects. Uh, although we have different aesthetical and uh, even ideological uh, uh, vision of the world and of the profession. So all this has been um, the fact that they could come to us, that we have a sort of, uh, uh, I would say, hospitality. Uh, I always, as an immigrant, uh, as a, also as a wanderer, I've been traveling in the 50s, always was impressed by, yes, by the generosity of people when I was knocking at the door in the night and asking for sleeping in the, the garage or in the, in the bar, if I was in the country, and they, they always opened the door. And then I felt that this is theater, something like Stanislavski wished that should be the theater houses where actors could travel and then go and visit and leave these uh, theater houses, which were the theaters. So always they were attracted from the very beginning, any group, theater group can come and perform and then we will give them the the, the, the money they uh, receive, receive from the, the, the box office and then uh, uh, sleeping and um, one meal. So the, the, this is <clears throat> because I feel very, very much connected to these, the people, the people of the uh, group, uh, group theater because they are in a way refugees, just like me. Yeah. And I think we all tend to forget how hard life was also for Italians. Um, there were lynchings in America also of Italians just for being Italian. There were discrimination in neighborhoods who were beaten up by Irish gangs uh, and others because they saw there's the one under them. I think a city university till today, Italians are kind of a, have minority status and have some protection. Um, so it's a, 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 incredible, especially Italians coming more from the south of Italy, the insults. So that experience, you transformed it in something. You said uh, also that um, somehow you are political, but with other means. Well, yeah, tell tell is, me a bit. You also mentioned that before. You said it was yeah, a political. Is, I'm very political. Tell me about. Tell us about this. When you experience. Uh, abuse and um, overpower on your own person, of course you start trying to find out who is responsible for this, not only the person who's doing this. And in the 50s, during the time of the Cold War, it was very evident that it existed a capitalist system and it was a communist uh, society and a vision of the how a society could be when the human being was not exploited. So of course I was on the, the side <coughs> of this vision, and this was the reason why I went to Poland because it was a communist country, and the time also came out uh, Jean Paul Sartre. Um, journal, the like town modern, modern times, an issue about a Polish theater, literature, graphics, uh, uh, <clears throat> film. It was in the early uh, end of the 50s when, uh, just say a few names, it probably will be known. People like uh, uh, Andrzej Wajda, Andrzej Munk, Gwaderowicz, the young Polanski were in the film. And then they were unbelievable. The, 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 the quality, the excellence of Polish theater 
I mean, I, I can mention I can Cantor, I can mention China, and the young Grotowski. So <clears throat> therefore I went there because it was the evidence that the system functioned like when I arrived there. Then I discovered the censorship, I discovered <laughs> sexual police, I discovered corruption, I discovered yeah, deep injustice. The deepest injustice was that the citizens were all prisoners of the state and they could not travel abroad. They had no possibility of uh, having a passport. This was the greatest injustice. For me, it was being an emigrant and the wonder and been visiting India and many other countries. So I was cured by my political ideas, or vision, but injustice continued to exist in the world. So how to fight? And then I thought that there can be a sort of politics where you have not to use political arguments, you have to use other arguments or other means or other tools. It what are these tools? The tools of beauty. And therefore, I say theater is politics with other, by other means. Is this true? I can only speak on the basis of my experience. After 53 years, I know that I have changed quite a lot in the small town I've been working. In the beginning, when the mayor, I'm not knowing anything about theater and was interested in having a theater company from Norway abroad so that we didn't speak the language of the place. But I thought it was fantastic because we accepted to be there because we didn't want a building. It's just a building. They had not just a building. We said any any venue. And they had their own farm outside the town. Fantastic. So we just from top of this farm. Therefore, it cost not very much to them. And they couldn't understand what sort of theater we're doing because we were not doing performances. So we started with these seminars, these workshops, publishing. Um, making a, a sociological uh, inquiry about the uh, um, habits of people or reactions of people who never been to theater, those who have been to, the, uh, to theater many times, etc. Et so all this su surprise. But what these politicians did, which is unique, was that when they, we made our first performance, and they saw a program in television, on television. They were very proud. For the first time, the town was coming on national television, but they were showing our training and they saw people rolling on the floor, screaming. They thought they, they, they had invited a small group of madmen and they reacted. Oh, the newspaper was full of letters citizens furious with their politicians. They are really stupid, they have been cheated by them. And this continued for many, many years. But strangely enough, the mayor <laughs> said, I'm not an expert in theater, but those who are experts in theater say that these young people have something. So let's wait a few years and see what they're going to do. This is the reason why I have meant possible because this mayor made possible to us to find our wings. They are in very special strange. We are like, they are, all of us are fish and we are selfish we have wings. <laughs> and with the years, we have been conquering, literally conquering the thing, but seducing and making one citizen after the other on the other side. The result was that when uh, about 10 years ago, 
uh, I made public the decision that we uh, of the Odin uh, have taken that when we die as people, individuals, no Odin Tartet must continue, must disappear the name because the, the people are the theater. No, we want not the building which keeps. So there was a, a, a huge reaction in the among the population and say, but we need Odin Tartet. You must uh, find out a solution so that something like you can continue. And this is, of course, uh, influenced the last 10 years of our uh, uh, work, uh, on my work and of those of my fellow uh, actors. Mm -hmm. So amazing. politics, politics, without never speaking. We went to South America, participated for a lot of situations where really <laughs> were arrested. And we were saying, well, we're naive Scandinavians, who well, we have been sent by our queen in order to show the folklore of our country and this change it with the um, cultural expressions of your country. Never speak about uh, social changes or revolution. I admire very much the Dream Theater, who was <laughs> very. Uh, Open in this. The living but, scene. Uh, the living yeah, scene, you mean? Yeah, Judas Molina and Julian yeah. Baker. I, I love them. They were two so beautiful people. I mean, uh, we invited them in uh, 75. They remained with us in about a couple of weeks. Joe Chakin also. I, I had in, in, in the beginning a uh, contact with. Uh, the American group theater, Ellen, Ellen Stewart. Ellen visited us in 66. It was unbelievable that she had just come to Denmark and visit a friend, and the friends spoke about this small group in this small town. And then she visited us after that. Uh, she all the time, she wanted us to come. And so at the end, uh, or the theater visited New York twice uh, in 1983, uh, uh, once and then in 2000, they visited because she insisted. And, um, <laughs> and Grotowski said, You must go to New York because only if you go to New York, we will take you seriously. Okay, so we did it. So we are. We were taken seriously, and therefore we are speaking with you. No, no, no. <laughs> that would be um, the other way around. Yeah. That is incredible. Yeah, I saw you. Uh, you, you know, after fifty years, you buried some of your stage props and costumes. You made a ceremony, you know, and to yeah, it I was guess a people came. I consider yeah. it much. This was uh, in the. <clears throat> After, after 50 years, we, we had so much there. And then what are we going to do? We didn't want to become a museum. And therefore we left the young, very, very young children from Bali, Kenya, uh, Brazil, and, and Italy. We were doing uh, theater or music. We invited them to this celebration. And they were probably, and they they helped us to bury all this. And then we planted a seesaw uh, on, on, on the on the place. Yes, um, you say the legend, and so it should be like a, a cloud, like a cloud there. Uh, from time to time, we somebody gets some uh, water from the cloud. That is us. Uh, were just uh, falling on the head of somebody. Uh, they will say, I told you, they can get some inspiration. Yeah, that was a very beautiful idea also. I guess the townspeople came in. You also, if I saw right, you had a blessing of a horse. Was that in the church in, in of your town? So you yeah, have an animal, you feel that, it, that this is a missing, is it a missing part or was it? I, I, li I like what I, I li 
to be subversive. What does it mean to be subversive? It is to subvert what is familiar, what is usual, and what everybody considers is normality. So how theater can subvert? How can theater be a sort of interference which creates confusion, mixing up, and disorientation, but at the same time makes people smile and be happy and accept this? This is, let's say, the, the strategy that even your enemies collaborate with you. And the idea was, we saw a remarkable, we, we knew them from before, but we, when we saw their performances also, a company, a theater company, a French in Marseille called the Théâtre du uh, Santo, Santo Theater. And they are so poetic, so beautiful, really. And then we decide to invite them. And then to place them in the main square where there is uh, the uh, city hall and the main church. But for first, it is prohibited in Denmark to have animals in them. So we had to convince the politicians and the uh, staff, and we managed. Then we had to solve all the problems of how to feed it, to build, um, to take away all the muck. We had 10 horses there. It was a lot of logistics. At the same time, the, uh, the people could no longer drive or go with bicycle. And, and, and therefore, this creates also a sort of urban uh, disturbance. But it was unbelievable because at five o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, when people was going to work, they went to the uh, to boxes where they all, the, the horses were there and they were giving carrots and they were picking and the young people, I, 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 they told me some of them, after discotheque at three o'clock in the night, they were going to this strange, strange, unbelievable universe of these horses. And they were taking the last beer there. And I seen one of the images which most has made me understand how we can change human relationships to theater or a sort of theatrical situation. I saw uh, two families close to two boxes of horses. One was a Dane, and the father was lifting his, uh, his child up to the horse, and then he was kissing the father, the horse, and then making the little child kiss the horse. Beside him was an Iraqi, Palestinian, I don't know, one just like me, <laughs> his, his wife with covered. Uh, yeah. And the father was lifting up his child and doing the same, kissing the horse and letting his child. Mm -hmm. And then they saw each other and they smiled each other and then they went. This is for me what yeah. theater can do, you see. And then for me, the greatest pleasure was to convince the, the priest, the pastor, to bless a santor, and he accepted. And then we made a huge ceremony with a concert uh, full of vitality, but with a deep respect for the sacrality, the solemn uh, aspect of, of life, which religion represents mm -hmm. certain people. And this blessing was really also something very, very touching. And, uh, and it was really unbelievable. A whole incredible concert. image. Yeah. yeah. She was a woman on a black horse standing, exactly. entering a full church inside. And she yeah. would bend backwards, lie on exactly. the animal, yeah, sit yeah. down, and the priest would bless the animal, and she would ride yeah. out of the yeah. church. Yeah. It's an incredible what idea what cedar can be. Somewhere. Where, where did where did Some you see clip? It? I saw that somewhere. Yeah, oh, yeah. Right. And uh, last time I think horses were where the French army came 
over to, to Germany and they would put their horses in the Cologne cathedrals, you know, to show that they didn't believe in God, but you, well, you, you said. Napoleon, Napoleon. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you, you, or that's what he did at San Marco, I think, in Venice. But uh, when he ended the idea of the Venice Republic, that was independent for so long. But I mean, the idea that theater can do that in that space, given new meaning, but still doing God's work in a way that's mm -hmm. co connecting us uh, to something bigger. And so um, it was remarkable, yeah. But when, when you say theater, it is politics with other means. What is politics? It is the longing for change. This is wish to change something. And we have changed mentality. Both sociologists, Mm -hmm. And even the mayor also says that uh, uh, Odin Theatre is accustomed the inhabitants to diversity to that point that there are no ethnic problems here. We have a rather huge uh, minority also of uh, uh, Muslims. And so no doubt, uh, and I think this is true. Yeah, absolutely. There was a great writer. He also was teaching it at our university Edouard uh, Glisson, and he said, it's a failure of imagination, the problem of racism. He said, it's people who cannot imagine. They might be very happy to have, you know, people from different, living next to them instead of just the yeah. same, but they cannot imagine it. And art can imagine yeah, for a moment. Yeah. And if it happens there, it can happen in life. And your town represents, I think, very much, and your life's incredible life's work um, represents it. What I'm interested in your idea of barter or exchange, you know, in that time of post corona, I mean, every New York artist, musician, theater artist, till the end of the year, there is nothing. There is no, God, no job, no gig. Um, restaurants even are closed. They might reopen where they could work and make money. Um, as a kind of um, economy, did that work for you? Was this, is this also part of, is it artistic ideas, uh, your barter, or is it also exchange of uh, an economic sense of work against no, protection is, no, the, place? The barter, the barter is a possibility to make different people who never would come together and exchange something which is uh, agreeable for both parts. If I go in a prison, if I find a person working in a prison who says, I guess, let's organize a barter. So I or one of my actors will go and speak to the, uh, the people there in the prison and say, we want to come and do something for you, scenes, etc. But nobody works for free. So you must also pay something, no money, but some of you, what you do, you can do. So someone uh, can make uh, 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 sketches, some can sing, some can tell a story. Uh, so they start organizing. And what happens? Find the bar is very important because it begins to create a completely different dynamic in the environment where which has to, uh, to uh, host us. So even in the prison, they, they, they have to change so that they can come together. Sometimes if there is also a female department, the female can come and join and then be separated. So this is, once again, uh, the purpose of the barter, just like the the, the horses, etc. How to be disruptive? How to be uh, subversive? But in a way that doesn't provoke, and that even those who are against it accept it. I mean, the director is uh, satisfied that that theater comes. There's, there's not to pay anything, and he, he can say, "Oh yeah, look in my prison, my my." The, the, the inmates uh, can do all this. And then we come and so it is not an economical, it is the moment with, with the inmates, we have nothing to do with, with me and my actors. And the same, my actors have, but nevertheless, it is as a sort of truth, uh, um, deep distant 
people can find something, just one hour, to exchange something. This is unbelievable, in a way. And then, of course, each of us is going and remaining in the, in the, let's say, in the difficult or indifferent situation where they live. But for a moment, there was this meeting where everybody was trying to present itself to what it is. It's not art. It's not art. Uh, uh, one of my actors is really specialized. Is, he lives in a small village outside Holstebro, and he has transformed the whole village in a village laboratory where there are about 100 families collaborate and they make a biennale. He says, but I take a person and this person is an old woman and this old woman is good to uh, water flowers. And then I make make a, a, a sort of structured performance where she's watering, she does what she knows and she does well. So this is in a way the idea of barter. But first of all, use barter in order to mobilize, to create a dynamic in the environment where you arrive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I very, very strongly believe that everybody starting out and people doing art thinking, how should theater look like even after or during or after time of Corona really, really should study what the solutions you found, the ideas um, you, uh, you lived through action, also through thoughts. And as you said, also incredibly enough through publishing, you very early on were a writer, you did the Katakali research, I know Richard Schechner when he was still in New Orleans in the Tulane Drama Review, when it was TDR was not theater, it was Tulane. You know, he, he published your work early on and you knew him and, uh, and that you were interested in this idea of a university or what you call it, you know, that um, the international school. Of, so it is also about um, education. So what you do, you create a community, you teach, you learned everything from your class. It's a model, I think, that that works and that is um, um, also um, showing in itself, you know, as a proof um, that is something, as you said, that seems impossible in the time we live, that something is, is, is possible. If I may ask that question, I might hopefully not sound too simplistic, but you said theater is necessary for me. What is this? Why you said that theater is necessary for you as an artist. That's the reason you do theater because it's necessary. So because why is it necessary? What is theater and why do we do it? I can only answer for myself. I don't know why other people uh, want to do theater. I, I chose theater because uh, I, I want to uh, find a solution to this uh, problem uh, of ethnic uh, recognition. It's, uh, when people see me, and if I say uh, I'm uh, an Italian, what I am, an Italian welder, or I'm even an Italian uh, teacher, there will be a reaction. If I am an artist, I automatically be, am treated in a different way. This was my way of thinking. Maybe I'm wrong, mm -hmm. <laughs> but but this was my way, which made me choose theater. And then I thought theater. <clears throat> I was not very, 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 <clears throat> from the very beginning aware of it. And then I slowly, you know, by solving practical problems, but uh, uh, which seemed for everybody impossible to solve, but I started solving it. And then you can do theater also far away from big towns. So in the whole begins, I began to understand that I could build a sort of micro society free of all the, the criteria, the norms. And this is how the audience artists, for me, for my colleagues, of course, there's a very strict discipline, self-discipline in order to uh, achieve certain results. Because you don't achieve, you don't achieve, we audience art people, because we are not big artists. But, 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 but what seems impossible is only the possible, which takes more time, 
and a lot more personal efforts. This is what characterizes us. We are a sort of stubborn, a bit infantile people who don't give up. Therefore, here the war is necessary for me because I promise to keep in my freedom. This type of the theater, which is a sort of my personal struggle together with the LME, an environment which has a certain values, which has a certain, uh, which recognizes the, the pleasure of generosity, of hospitality, and well, diversity is the normality. I mean, we are 25 people living here, different colors, different races, different religions, different uh, uh, genders. So this is a permitted and therefore it's necessary. Not because it's a entertainment or change the world, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's incredible. And in a way, I mean, there's a beautiful poem by Rilke I always like, and it talks about the son who had to go to the church in the East because his father wouldn't go there and he felt he had to leave behind. You went to Poland, you went to India. Um, do, do you feel the, the, that, um, that we have to pay still attention to, to a world of um, mysticism or spirituality or something that perhaps came to there. Um, is that something where you feel Western theater um, should uh, refocus? You, you are so well known for your work with voice and body, your, your significant groundbreaking work of training the voice and the body. Um, do you feel that this is still what companies should be doing or do you do, do you are you looking also at other directions we all have a an enemy which is a routine uh, we after a, a certain uh, moment we try to find something new. Know, this is a necessity, uh, especially when the, the director and the actors are always the same. We know each other very well. Um, if I go in and meet a group of other actors, they are different. So there is a sort of uh, novelty in these relationships. But uh, our relationships are uh, so established after 50 years, 55 years, 40 years. So we know each other very well. So, the uh, the uh, what I call the earthquake in the group are very important. Otherwise, we get extremely bored. And we, if we are bored in an environment, we want to go away. This is the the law of, of life. We human beings are attracted by the way energy and stimuli. So for us, the only thing is. It, very, very important to, 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 to invent situations which disorient and create a sort of, uh, uh, I call them earthquake, and where we have to build again the group dynamic, uh, but using the experience we have, we have to use it in a different way. And already the fact that the whole uh, uh, dynamic of the group is one of introvert, extrovert, um, uh, where the individualistic tendency are enhanced so that each of them has their own in interests that are very different. So part of the year, they can uh, involve themselves in this. And then part of the year, they can come back and find the security and at the same time, the challenge, which uh, we all, a wish to create in order not to uh, remain prisoner of routine. So all this is very present in our culture, in our group culture. Johannes thinks all, all of this. How can I surprise my colleagues? How can <laughs> they say, no, are you doing this? So life is movement. Life is change. Life is energy which all time 
uh, transforms itself. And if you don't follow this, then uh, it stagnates. And people leave you, and they have a right. They are right to leave you because you are no longer nourishing them. Yeah, yeah this is... Um... This is an important you know, that life. Life is movement and it's energy and it has to transform. And we are in that big, big moment of transformation. As Spider Woman, that Native American women's company we had on Monday, she said, perhaps we are in a moment of a new creational myth. We, something is starting, but we don't know what will happen. As the stories all are, and mythical stories, if you listen to them, whether it's the Mahabharata or the Tazir, we don't. But now we know because we tell them, but right now we are in the middle and you have found something almost like a, you ate a little bit from the apple of the tree of knowledge. You stole something from the paradise. I think it was Kleis, which I admire very, very much when his essay on the marionette theater said, maybe, maybe theater. And he, of course, talked about puppetry is the way to get the back door into paradise in that state of innocence and bliss and marveling at the world and searching for truth. But also because when that this is and you you uh, you did that and I also like what you said. I never thought about it, this Arturian idea. I think Joseph Campbell, this who wrote so much about stories, said the East story of the East often were gurus. You know, like perhaps Kwiatkowski and uh, Kanto were like gurus, and he had to follow them. He forbid his company members Kanto to see other performances. He would they were not even supposed to leave their hotels when they were in New York. And but you said no, they are more like the knights uh, of the tale round table they go out they slay their own dragons come back but they tell the story and this is our western uh, myth at the moment that we are that we are living and um, and that is perhaps a way to uh, to think about life as perhaps the old homeric tales with the multiplicity of gods uh, you have to honor you don't honor one everything is in, in uh, but frank, this way. yeah frank one of the Learning a technique, a, a profession, is not just learning and know-how. You also learn certain values. And when you were mentioning that uh, the knights going each to fight their own dragon, this has been learned by learning to be an actor. And the actor has to do this as a knight of King Arthur, you have to save women from bad dragons. But this may be the main difference between theater groups and uh, the uh, main theater which is very efficient, they can create performances which can be very interesting. That in the theater groups, it exists a sort of uh, uh, emotional, visual justification of uh, a sort of metaphysics of our profession. Sometimes it's not exposed, sometimes it's very naive, sometimes it becomes uh, rough, uh, ideological, uh, blah, blah, blah. But it exists, it, it, and it, it's something which nourishes the personal secret wounds of the, the the members of the of the groups. So theater is not only uh, art; it's very abstract. The theater are the women and the men who do it. Each of them very vulnerable, and they all of them are right. To our profession because they are escaping from something. Yeah, yeah, really, uh, Junio, thank you really for coming closer to the, to the end. And again, also your point in create a micro society, a micro organism that works if theater makes sense because it's a model for something. That's why some people hate it and it's banished. Our Indian colleague, uh, uh, sad, you know, who we, we interviewed here, uh, Abhishek said, you know, 
movies in India, no one cares. They can be as good as I do a little play in my company. I get censored. They say no. So ask the government if it's important what I do. It is. And, um, and I think for you to create that model in your life, uh, in your work as an artist, and also to create the space for everybody to, to, to perform their lives, their own lives, but also their work is, a, is fantastic. And I think it has many, many answers what we are looking for. And our little motto is Brecht's idea that new times need new forms of theater, but sometimes they are also you know, recycle, I have to look back. I mean, nothing is new under the sun as, uh, as uh, Beckett uh, taught us. As a last uh, statement, uh, and um, of course it might sound like a heavy question to you, but we do really often ask it at the very end. So what do you say to uh, young, um, uh, young artists, or people, also our listeners who are at home to use the time, but how to do art? I mean, if you would think of young Eugenio who maybe was still a welder and you got mistreated and said, I'm don't, I study, but I don't want to do, I'm going to start my company. And you didn't know, will you survive? You put your life at risk, uh, your reputation, you know, and what your family thought of you. But what in the time of Corona where already in New York is impossible to do theater if you don't have money and you're not, a, often they say a trust fund and you're not white and you've not a trust fund baby, but it's, and for them it's hard enough and I admire them. But what, what do you say to our, what, to, what should we all do now in this moment we live in? And what should artists do? What's the meaning? What meaning can we create? I can only say that uh, <clears throat> be proud of what you are and conquer your diversity and uh, make it, it be respected and accepted through your personal way of behaving, your doings, your sacrifices, your achievements. Start from tomorrow, getting up one hour before, then today. And don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Seven times on the floor, it's up Sunday. Your Worst enemy is yourself, because you have a tendency to be satisfied with the first result, to accept the uh, norms of the others. And first of all, let small compromise erode your uh, courage and uh, rage. You have to fight because nobody will help you. You have to find the people with whom you have a certain affinity and be able to collaborate. You have to fight like a snake sometimes. Sometimes you have to fight like a dove, but uh, you have to learn to choose consciously the longest and most difficult path because it's there the unforeseeable, the surprise, the real enlightenment for yourself and for the other is. You have to teach yourself to be strong and don't expect help from anybody. Okay. This is a very, very significant advice from Eugenio with a whole life behind it and a whole experience and and most probably not the 10,000 hours, the 100,000 hours of real work to, to, to prove it. This is most significant. And maybe we all should go back and listen to it again. We, uh, but this is a significant um, and, and an important um, um, rem rem reminder what, what we should be doing and also what works. And that is also what all the stories and mystics told us. If you do 
what you say it will something will good will come out and if your roof is broken that rains in but you see the moon so uh, i hope this time will help us to uh, get closer to the work what you represent and what you already did on your own very difficult circumstances with this great great resonance in people and you change people's lives and the idea what theater all is about so it's been a great uh, privilege for us to um to hear from you and um and i would like to really thank you in the name of the siegel center the graduate center cuny and hull round and everybody listening for taking your time and 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 uh, speaking speaking to us i know that's uh working as you said so much and so hard so but it, it, it was really important i felt and um and we had to had to had to have you with us here so to our listeners um please do think about what he said we need a, a great theater but as eugenio said it's all about the audience actually it's all about you and what you do with it and how it means in your life that it affects something in that border and uh and uh, this is what's important. And Roland Barthes, the great critic, said, your literature, he said, yeah, OK, they write books. But what's important, how we read it, how what we make out, how we compare it, uh, Proust against, uh, you know, uh, Zola and others, how what you do about it. And I think this is also something in origin is providing us something to look at, to think about a space. But ultimately, it's what you do and then what action you take out of it to save your own lives. And, to make this country better when it looks like a in terrible mythical stories where the king is mad and there is a plague in the country and it ha someone has to come up to help and change in your own micro society and it's actually you who is listening it's me it's us and Eugenio did that so this is incredible uh, significance um, what you said today and tomorrow we will hear from a new york actor um, how he's a director, Paul Price, how he's experienced this moment in New York, also as a, as a black uh, artist uh, in that uh, time. And Friday, we have Liva Yatsi, who's a Syrian writer, playwright, poet, also director of documentary films, and how she's experienced seeing this moment. But really, thank you, Eugenio, again. And I hope um, uh, it was uh, uh, a little bit uh, also of, of meaning for you and I can only wish it would be as inspiring to everybody as this talk was for me that listening to you thank you again and uh, I hope you will have a good uh, um, a good dinner what I, what will be your dinner be in Denmark tonight what are you going to have do you know I always eat Italian food like my oh. mother's. <laughs> your mother's and you cook it you cook it yeah hmm? you no, cook no, it? but my, my wife uh, do it they are good. So I hope you will have a, a wonderful, a wonderful dish tonight. Again, thank you. And to all our listeners, thank you for yeah. taking the time out of your life. I know it's much busier these days than we think. They are so full of uncertainties and to listen also for a longer time. It's a big commitment, as Jinyu said, you for an audience. But it is something that happens in between. Thanks for HowlRound for hosting us, Thea, VJ, and my Siegel team, Andy and Sun Yang. And please all do uh, stay safe and to stay tuned in and I hope we will all see a better days nothing lasts forever not the good things but also not the terrible things so we will get over this but we should be prepared as Gina said the moment before you shoot the arrow uh, this is the important one and this is one in which we are experiencing so thank you thank you bye bye thank you very much Frank and to you and your collaborators 